Good morning, Central family and friends who may be with us from both near and far. I'm delighted that you're with us today. Uh, together, we're together to the best of our ability. Uh, please feel free to comment below. I hope that uh, below the video to greet others who may be watching with you. Uh, perhaps again, giving us an indication, checking in, if you will, letting us know where you're from. Uh, I've been encouraged over the last few weeks uh, to know that there are others in other parts of the country and perhaps even beyond the borders of this great country uh, that might be watching with us, whether live or recorded and viewed later. Have you embraced this new normal, as some people might call it? I hope that you're making the best of it. I also realize that it's not ideal, it's not what we want. Uh, I don't want this to become too comfortable. Uh, I speak about the worship that we're participating in together this morning or all the other things about our life these days. Well, sure, there are some parts of my daily schedule that uh, I enjoy, particularly. Uh, I get to spend more time with my wife and children here lately, and I appreciate that. That's a good thing. I wouldn't want to change that. But there are many other things that I miss about how life used to be and anticipate perhaps being able to enjoy those things again in the future. Beyond your memory, have you recorded the things that have happened? I've seen others that have encouraged people to perhaps journal or, or document the events of the last few weeks. History will certainly record those things. Perhaps your social media posts will reflect events that took place and your thoughts and feelings as those things occurred. Uh, my wife on our calendar at home, on our refrigerator, has written down or marked certain days as events have occurred, things that have changed, the, the moments when our lives were disrupted and kind of changed. I want you to consider those things because today we're going to spend time talking about a particular day that changed everything. And I know that you're prepared this morning to think about the empty tomb, to think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ on this Easter Sunday. Perhaps there's, there's more of you today, gathered in today, because you're, you're focused and you're reflecting on, again, the risen Savior. And so that's a day that, that changed things forever, and we'll spend time this morning celebrating the risen Lord. In just a moment, we're going to have a number of songs uh, that will be played. And again, as I've said before, I want to encourage you, they're going to be familiar uh, to a number of you. I want to encourage you to the best of your ability to sing along at home, whether you're on your own or together with loved ones, to participate in that opportunity to worship. After the songs have concluded, we will spend some time prepared to share in, in communion to reflect on Jesus. And if you're prepared to participate with us together, look forward to that. If you aren't prepared at home to, to share in that communion, it'll offer a time where you can quietly spend some time in meditation to think about the Son of God. We'll worship in song together now. Jesus.
the Apostle Paul spoke in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He wanted to address Christians who were meeting together in Corinth and who uh, had not handled the Lord's Supper as they should. And he wanted to spell out for them uh, specifically uh, what they were to think about or be mindful of. And so this morning I'll share these words with you as we reflect on Jesus and what he did for us. In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks of the cup or drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. We spend time thinking about Jesus specifically on this time, on the first day of each week. We, we share in this communion time together to reflect on Jesus and what he did, simply to remember Jesus and what he did. Even as we reflect on the resurrection today, there's also a, a thought behind as we partake of this bread and then the cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until a time when he comes again, a recognition again of the risen Lord. Let's spend time in prayer thanking God for his, his son and before we take of the, the bread together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his great sacrifice. We're thankful for his willingness to go to the cross, to suffer so, uh, so terribly. For each of us. We're thankful for what his death on the cross means for us, for the forgiveness that is found through that sacrifice and through his death. Father, we reflect on his broken body. Help us as we partake of this bread to do so in remembrance of him, to think about Jesus, to clear our minds of other things that may be distracting us and, and pulling our attention in different ways. Help us again to focus our thoughts on Jesus. We thank you again for that sacrifice that he made. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's likewise honor God as we partake of the cup and pray giving thanks for the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we approach you once more. We think about the cross. We think about Jesus as he hung there. We think about the blood that was shed. And Father, it hurts. It hurts us to consider what Jesus went through. But we recognize it was because of your love for us and his love for man that helped him to be willing to give of himself in such a way. We're thankful for the blood that was shed, which again offers forgiveness. We're mindful of that blood as we partake of the cup. Help us uh, once more to clear our minds, to focus our thoughts, to remember Jesus. And through this time together as we partake of this cup and, and earlier the bread, we proclaim to others, again, our confidence 
and our hope that comes through Jesus and looking forward to his return. Father, thank you for your son. Help us again to remember. Help us to examine ourselves as we do so. Father, thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. On a weekly basis, Christians are also asked and take the opportunity to give of their, their means to support the work of, of the church, to support the ministries that take place to assist in the spreading of the good news of Jesus to those around them. Uh, I, I can say to those who are watching from the Central Church that you're to be commended with continuing to give as you're able. Many have mailed their offerings and contributions to the church building. Others have taken care of uh, those needs again as they have uh, time to do so. I want to encourage anyone watching to continue to be givers, to be joyful givers. It may be that this particular time that you have a harder time doing so. Circumstances have affected your ability to give. It's also quite possible that some may have uh, more opportunities to give. As we don't spend money on, on certain other things perhaps, uh, we're not filling our gas tanks near as often. Uh, we have other expenses that maybe uh, we aren't incurring on a regular basis. But be encouraged to continue to give to your local church family. Again, I, I've been encouraged to also see others who are giving to those in their community, who are helping those in need. And again, what a, what a heartwarming uh, you know, occurrence to see those things taking place and to see people uh, being in the hands and feet of Jesus to those around them. Our main text this morning is going to be in Luke chapter 24. If you've got your Bibles in front of you, you can turn to Luke chapter 24 if you'd like to follow along. As we begin this morning, I want to ask you again, I really enjoy, you know, kind of remembering dates. You know, there are certain dates that, that stand out, certain dates that, that stick in my mind because of their great significance. Certainly birthdays uh, of my loved ones are important, as they are to you as well. Maybe uh, your wedding anniversary is a date that, that I hope that you don't forget. You know, you think about certain dates in your life that bring you joy because you think about a person who maybe came into your life or a relationship that began. Maybe there are other dates in your life that stand out for a different reason. Maybe certain things that happened to you that you're not thrilled about. Certain times in your life when things went a different direction and maybe went, went south, so to speak. But we have certain dates, again, that we reflect on and, and we realize that they represent a turning point in our individual lives. Well, this morning we think about, again, this particular day that changed everything. And its, significant is, its significance is far greater than any other date that any of us can, can share with just our family. But it's a date or a particular day when, again, circumstances are changed for the entire world. For all those who lived at that moment and for all those who would come. In Luke chapter 24, it's, it says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women 
took the spices. They had prepared and, and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, but be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with him who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. A little bit later in that same chapter, in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel, in verse 36, it says that while they were still talking about this, this being again the disciples, Jesus stood himself, stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked him, asked them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Can you imagine what that was like? Can you imagine the scene that played itself out as first the women who had approached the tomb and then Peter is, is uh, recognized as going to the tomb to search for himself. And then later for Jesus to make an appearance among his disciples, surprising them with, with being able to, to see and touch and feel the risen Lord. Why is that so significant? You see, I believe that this particular event and, and its importance can't certainly be overstated. We think about what Jesus did in conquering the grave and the power that he showed in doing so and what that means to each of us. You see, here's why that day is like no other, is that day changed everything. You see, I'd suggest to you that that day even changed the past. Now, you might say, well, Rick, that, that's impossible. Don't you wish that you could change the past? Don't you wish that you had the ability to go back in time and, and, and change things? Have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever done something wrong? Maybe even uttered a, a careless word. You said something to someone and, and you knew that maybe as soon as you said it, that uh, you wish you could take those words back, but it was too late. We live in a world today where we can even type out words and prepare to communicate them in an electronic form. Sometimes you'll have a text message or an email and you'll read the words over and over again to make sure that it says exactly what you want it to say. And then you'll hit send. And then you'll think that maybe there was a mistake. Or there was a word that, uh, or a phrase that you wish that you could take back. But alas, it's too late. And, and now we live in that age where, where not just your spoken words might be remembered in the memories of your, your friend or your loved one. But now... 
you know, those, those written words can, can stay right there and be read repeatedly over and over again. I wish that I could turn back the clock and change things. I wish that I could go back and, and erase my mistakes. I wish that I could. But you see what Jesus did, I believe, changed the past. And I'll explain why. You know, as, as, as the, the women approached the tomb, as Peter lay, later on approached the tomb, as the disciples then were confronted by Jesus, and while he shared with them, there were things that were talked about multiple places in what we read, that they specifically, starting in verse number 8, Jesus had told them, hey, this is what I told you would happen. And suddenly, in verse 8, then they remembered his words. Jesus told his disciples later, this, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. Those things that I talked about before, and it says that their minds were eventually opened to understand the scriptures. They recognized what was written, that Christ would suffer and then rise from the dead on the third day. You see, while, while Jesus' resurrection didn't change what happened before, it didn't change history in that way, it suddenly opened their eyes and opens our eyes. Suddenly we look back and we visual, visualize the cross and it takes on new meaning. We think about the death, the burial, the resurrection, and we realize that it's a fulfillment of God's plan. When the Apostle Paul speaks about the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he, he spells out that the gospel defined is that death, burial, and resurrection. And so suddenly we look back and, and we recognize things are different now. For, for those who had, had encountered or had found themselves either at the cross or observing from a distance or aware of what Jesus had done or what had happened to Jesus on the cross, suddenly they saw the big picture. And again, that affected their, their view. It affected how things looked in the past. It certainly changed their present. I can't imagine the emotion that went through, perhaps some of you have taken the last few days, to think about the cross and to think about the day after. To think about the thoughts and the emotion that again, as, as we don't have much record of anything taking place on that, that Saturday, on that Sabbath, on a time when, when Jesus laid in the tomb. Well, we can only imagine, and we could, we could predict with pretty, pretty certainty because we know we've been there ourselves. We've all experienced grief at times. That's the emotion that's felt. Sadness, despair, loss. Frustration as they probably examined themselves for those who, who had fled the scene, for those who had denied Jesus, for those who hadn't stood up for their friend. Oh, it was a day of, of pain and hardship. Have you ever had a restless night? I bet you have. And certainly for those who loved Jesus, the nights following his crucifixion weren't, weren't a restful sleep. It might have been certainly restless. It might have included nightmares and certainly visions of what they had, had witnessed. And again, those, those, that hurt that didn't seem to ease. But suddenly in that present moment, as they opened their eyes and as this new day began, suddenly things changed. And so their present changed. Those memories of pain and suffering were, were no longer a part of who they were. You know, uh, the last couple of weeks have provided tough days for everyone. You've experienced those, right? You know, I had one yesterday. And for a lot of people watching, uh, you're aware, and I've shared with you that, uh, boy, I love, I love Spring Mill Bible Camp, a camp here in, almost in my backyard. And it's a place that's special to me because of the people, because of the memories, because of what I know takes place there each summer. And, and yesterday, I was here in this building, and involved in a conference call that, that involved discussion about modifying and changing and even, yes, canceling some of the plans to take place this summer with a date later decision about the rest of the summer activities. And boy, it hurt to make that decision. And it hurt because I knew that it would affect individuals, young people, it would affect families. Boy, it affected me. I was disappointed. I was, it, it broke my heart to consider that. 
So we made the decision and I, and I made a few phone calls and talked with some probably who are watching and, and communicated again the, the choices that had been made. And then I walked around this building by myself for a little bit and I was just disappointed. You know, my head was down and it came time where I, I thought, well, it's time to leave. And as I walked outside, the first thing that hit me was the fresh air and the sun that was shining. And then next to our church building, there is in the backyard, a fenced backyard of some neighbors to our building, set a little playground area. And on the playground, there was a boy, probably around five or six years old, and he was just on the swing, going back and forth. And I looked at that little boy, and, and I realized, well, what's his perspective? He's sitting there on the swing without a care in the world. His needs are provided for. He's not concerned uh, uh, about, uh, about a virus or anything else or what he has to eat or, or, or a clothing on his back. And I thought to myself, and I was reminded to think about the care that, that God extends to me. I'm reminded again that I have no need to worry again in the present and certainly in a spiritual sense as we think about the empty tomb. And we celebrate that today, and I hope that you'll celebrate and be mindful of that every day. It changes everything. It changes our perspective. It changes, you know, while the world today is filled with trouble and hardship and heartache and difficult moments, and maybe because of what's taken place in recent weeks, more than usual. But if you're a Christian and you recognize Jesus as Lord, your perspective is different. And that leads to another point. While Jesus, the resurrection, again, we, we think it, it changes the past and changes the present, it most certainly changes the future. It provides for our future. You know, the world would teach that there's wisdom in preparing for the future. You know, you, you should make sure that you have adequate insurance. You should make sure that you, uh, uh, you know, provide for retirement. Maybe that you should say for your young people, for your, their college education. You know, the world would say there is wisdom in preparing for the future, not just for yourself, but also for your loved ones. And certainly we think about the resurrection of Jesus, and that certainly goes to providing for our future. And if you're watching this today and you have your children or your family gathered at your feet or sitting beside you, I commend you because you're making efforts to prepare for their future. And there's great wisdom in that and certainly beyond what this world would teach. And, and those things are good principles to live by. But in a spiritual sense, we think about our spiritual future. Consider today, have you taken care of yourself? Consider how you've provided for the spiritual needs for yourself and for those that you love and care about. I want you to look, if you still have your Bibles open, and go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, again, the inspired words from the Apostle Paul to Christians in Rome. And he says this starting in verse number 2, or verse number 3. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. You know, as we close here in just a couple of moments, I want you to think about two things very seriously. First, I would encourage you to be able, as a Christian, to rejoice in the fact, uh, in, in the knowledge, what we gain here, that Jesus overcame 
death. You know, uh, the Bible talks about his ability to overcome death and, and therefore giving us that same opportunity. We don't have to fear death because Jesus conquered death. We too, as Romans chapter 6 pointed out, can live a life that where we raise from the dead, we don't have to fear physical death. But I also want to encourage you today to consider, have you taken care of your spiritual needs? Jesus has done his part. He did so on the cross. He did so by being buried, and he did so by being raised on the third day. But Romans chapter 6 spells it out quite clearly. That again, and, and what, a, what a mental picture, what an image that we can have to consider what Jesus says here. That when we are baptized, and I don't know if there's anyone watching, but I, I see some folks or I hear some things from time to time of people who might diminish the need to be baptized. Romans chapter 6 makes it quite clear to me that those who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. And go on to say, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I want to encourage you, if you haven't made the decision to become a Christian, to do so. To do so today, if that's something that you desire to do. And reach out to me, comment here, or message me, or through the church page at the Central Church in Bedford. And we'd love to assist you with that. I know there's a virus. I've got a mask to wear. And, and we can make arrangements to, to take care of this today because of its great importance. But what a, what a blessing it is to participate in that process to be baptized into Christ, to be buried with Christ in baptism. And as we celebrate again the risen Lord, there's this image that we too can raise again, that we may have a new life. The Bible also says that it's at that point that we have our sins washed away. Our relationship with God is one in which we can be restored, but we first must decide to crucify the old self, to put to death the old self. And that's not an easy decision to do, but I want to encourage you to give thought to that today. If you haven't yet made the decision to become a Christian, it's not too late. And, and, and the, the opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ will be all the more significant for you once you've become a Christian, once you've been baptized into Christ. I want you to give thought to these things. I want to conclude with a prayer. And after this particular prayer, there'll be one more song that'll be played. Again, sing along. Maybe after the song concludes and this video ends, perhaps take time on your own or with your family to pray, giving thanks to God for Jesus and for his death, burial, and resurrection. Let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, once more, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your son. We're thankful for his life and for his example. We're thankful for the cross. Despite the pain that he went through, we, we know its significance. We can look back and recognize what he did for us because he loved us. Father, we're thankful for his death, for his burial, and certainly his resurrection. We're thankful that the tomb was found empty. We celebrate today, as, as people did then, that Jesus is alive. And so today we celebrate that he lives. And Father, he continues to live. Help us now to prepare ourselves for that time when he will return again. If there's anyone watching today or participating in this worship who's not yet become a Christian, who, who haven't yet put Christ on in baptism, who haven't been baptized into his death to rise and walk a new life, help them to be encouraged to crucify the old self. Help those who are watching this who have already made that decision to live in such a way that each and every day they're thankful for the risen Lord and they're prepared for that time when he'll return and come again. Father, we ask your blessing to be upon those who are suffering at this time, those in our country and beyond who are going through physical hardship because of the virus or because of other circumstances. Father, those who are enduring financial difficulties because of what's taking place. Father, those whose relationships need uh, to be addressed but again, more than anything, help us to address a relationship with you. Father, we thank you for the risen Lord. We give you thanks once more in Jesus' name. Amen.